Well, hey guys, Mark Pickard here with Southeast Missouri Community Church. I appreciate you guys joining me this morning or whatever time it is that you've decided to watch this video. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this off a little bit different. I'm going to go ahead and let you know what's been going on behind the scenes, okay? So uh, this is considered our Sunday morning sermon, and this is what we've had to do for the last four or five weeks. Uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, it seems like it's easy. You know, you put on a video, you record a video, and you put it online, and everybody watches it. And, it, you know, it's easy for everybody sitting at home, but to be honest with you, with you, it takes more work to do this than it is to just get up and preach a sermon in front of a bunch of people. Um, and what I've noticed over these last few weeks is it's kind of taken a toll on me, okay? It's kind of drained me down a little bit. Um, and it's really kind of came to a head today. And, and my sermon is perfect for this because a lot of times we write these sermons for what we need, not necessarily for what you need. And so I, I'm just going to be straightforward with you guys. Uh, I became very frustrated. This is about my sixth time starting this sermon, and every time I, I, and I've even made the rule that I don't restart sermons, but I made the rule that this time, I, this is like my sixth time starting the sermon. I went over here, and I sat in the chairs behind you, and I laid my head down, and I was praying to God, and that's whenever the Lord reminded me of the sermon I'm about to preach to you, uh, because the sermon I'm going to read to you, uh, the, actually the scripture I want to read to you comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's called the love chapter. And let me just read these first few verses, verses 1, 2, and 3 to you. It says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. He says in verse 3, he says, If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, I read those scriptures to you, and the reason I'm, I'm going straight into those scriptures real quick is because when I was had my head down on that chair a while ago, feeling sorry for myself, feeling frustrated because I, I couldn't, figure out, couldn't figure out how to get the sermon started, God reminded me of this scripture right here where he says, uh, if I can fathom all the mysteries of knowledge, if I can preach, if I can teach, if I can do prophecies, if I have the faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. What I realized is I've been going through the motions. It's easy to get to the point where, as pastors, that we go through the motions. And I guess if, if I was standing in front of my own church, it would be no different than it is right now. If I don't do this for the right reasons, then I'm going through the motions. And if you're like me, you've done this before in your life, where you've just gone through the motions, where the work that you're doing is worthless because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. We've all done this. We all start something, and we, we're, it's something we're supposed to have a heart devoted to. And it could be a relationship. It could be anything from, from the way that you raise your kids, from loving on your kids, spending quality time with your kids or your spouse. It could be to the job that you have. And, and the Bible tells us that if you don't do it for the right reasons— don't do it. Basically, you're wasting your time. And I call this the worthless work. That there's a lot of things that we do, that we go through our lives, that we think that, oh, I'm really contributing to society, I'm really helping things out. And really what you're doing is just kind of wasting your time. He gives us three things here. He says, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I'm like a resounding gong. And that's what I've been. That's where I started this sermon at, is the sermon at, is I was just speaking tongues, I guess you would say, but I didn't do it for the right reasons. Tongue speaking, if you guys will remember, is something that came from the Lord. It was given to us in Acts chapter 2, where it says that the Holy Spirit came down upon the people and they were able to speak in tongues. Tongues are actually a different language, an actual language that's here on earth. And so whenever they spoke those tongues, because the Holy Spirit gave them, other people who spoke that same language could understand them. They weren't interpreting them. They understood exactly what they were saying. It was a gift that came straight from God. And in this case, he says, even if you can do that, if it comes from the Holy Spirit and you can speak in a different language, if you don't do it with love, he says, it's like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Basically, it's just noises coming out. This is a God-given gift that he's saying that if you don't do it with love as the background, as the foundation, then you're doing it for no reason whatsoever. He says, if you have the gift of prophecy, and you can fathom all the mysteries and knowledge. Basically, he's saying, if you can forecast the future, 
If you're the type of person that God has given you the gift of prophecy, which is a prediction or an utterance from a prophet inspired by God, meaning God has spoken to you and you've got that gift to know what's going to happen in the future. And there are people out there who have this because God has given it to them and God given gifts are real. He says, you're wasting your time if you don't have love. He talks about the apostles. He says, if you can fathom all the mysteries of knowledge, and those are people who understand God better than other people, people who can put into words exactly the teachings of Jesus Christ and of what he's given us. It's kind of like when he does the the parable about the seeds, and, and he does this parable, and a lot of the regular people don't understand what's going on, but his apostles did. He says, even if you can understand all those things, even if you have that deep down faith, that powerful, powerful faith, that can move mountains, that can change the world. He says, if you have all of those things, but you don't have it with love, moving mountains with faith, it's worthless actions. And I can tell you right now, I've done this so many times and I'm sick and tired of it. I'm tired of going through the motions at times. And I know what I do. I can tell you, this is Mark talking, okay? I can know what happens. I get too many things on my plate. And I, I plan my day out. I, when I wake up in the morning, no matter what time it is, I know what the rest of my day is going to look like. And then anxiety kicks in. If I don't stay on that schedule, I, I have anxiety kick in. And you're not going to see the anxiety. My wife can see the anxiety. But most people are not going to see the anxiety. And it's my fault for doing them without love. Because if you have love, you're going to have those characteristics we'll read here in a little bit that gives you absolute patience to deal with all the problems that come in your life. Verse 3, he said this, If I give all that I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gave nothing. He's talking about a person who has an absolute selfless living, that, that they expend all of their time and all of their efforts and all of the things that they have to give to other people. And whenever I I was reading about this scripture right here, it reminded me of a mission trip that I went on. And I'll look back, I wish I'd never gone on the mission trip. It was one of those that whenever I I planned the mission trip because the kids that I had in my youth group wanted to go on it. And so I paid my own money to go on it. And we planned this mission trip out and we we traveled on this mission trip. And we went up there and we did this work uh, at people's houses and we were helping them out doing this, this God's work for those people. But I was miserable the whole time because I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I was doing it to appease some kids that wanted to go. I was doing it because, well, that was what was expected of me. I wasn't doing it out of love. And though every day I went to this person's house and I worked hard on her house and I shared Jesus with her, it wasn't out of love that I was doing it. I was, I was going through the motions. And he tells us that when you do those things, he says, you gain nothing from it. I gave him my time. I gave him my own money. And I know what was going on. I had a new son at home that I was frustrated that I wasn't with. My wife was at home that I was frustrated I wasn't with. I had college homework that I had to do. I had all this other stuff on my plate that I needed to do. And though I should have gotten some benefit when I get to heaven for the work I did there, I gained nothing. I think what it comes down to is this. Why we do things is just as important as what we do. In fact, they're the basis as to why we do them, what we do. And and you have to get your why right before you even do it. And, and that's where he gives us guidance on this. He actually gives us scriptures that tells us exactly how we do this. And it's all based upon this thing called love. And I know that you guys are sitting there thinking, oh, well, that's a sissy thing to be preaching about. Love, love, love. Folks, it's what everything revolves around. It is the flavoring of life. And when you have love in your life, it changes everything. It changes your motivation. It changes your inspiration. It changes everything about you. It's the flavor of life. And when love is involved in something, it just changes it. I remember whenever Hope and I first started dating, okay, uh, I wasn't much of a cook by all means. And now, in fact, I wasn't a cook by any means. My chosen um, recipe to cook for her was Hamburger Helper. But it wasn't, don't, all y'all are judging me right now. But listen, it wasn't just Hamburger Helper, okay? It was Hamburger Helper plus this plus that plus this plus that. And you just named, I mean, I put so much stuff in there, you wouldn't even know that there's Hamburger Helper in it. I, I spent a lot of time on my Hamburger Helper, okay? And went, went from a, a, what would be a box, you know, like a little bitty meal, 
It was a four course meal right there in that one pan by itself. And I put a lot of heart into it and Hope would sit down and she would do that whole thing. Mmm, this is good. Thank you so much for making this. And I knew deep down she didn't like it, but I didn't make it. I still made her eat it because I loved her and I knew that she loved me and it had a better flavor to it just because of that love. Eventually I figured out that she didn't like it and out of love, I quit making it from her. But you know what? When it comes down to it, love changes things. It changes everything if you've got love in your heart and god tells us to do things out of love don't do them for the wrong reasons do them out of love let's do this as an example we've all done this before you've gone to walmart or some other place you've gone to walmart and you, you see that one person that you try to avoid now I, i've never done that but i'm sure you have you see that one person that you're trying to avoid and you see that that man or that woman over there, and you know that if you start that conversation with them, as soon as you get in that conversation, you're going to be wishing that you weren't in that conversation. And, and so you try to go down an aisle, and the minute that you cut down a different aisle to avoid that person, they come down that aisle with you. Well, if you're a person who has love in your heart for that person, first of all, I guess you probably wouldn't have tried to avoid that aisle. But either way, let's say that you, you still did and you still got caught by him. It should change the way that you, you talk to them. It should change the way that you listen to them, okay? Let's start this. He says this in verse 4. He says, he gives us the, the characteristics of love. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. So let's say this friend that you run into or this person that you run into starts to tell you about his sicknesses that he's had. He starts to tell you all about his sicknesses and how it's been so bad that he's had to deal with this type of sickness. And if you're a proud person, if you're an impatient person, if you're worried about yourself and you're selfless, you're going to be sitting there the whole time trying to one-up that person, trying to tell them about, well, you know, man, when I had that sickness, this is what I did with it. Or whenever I dealt with that, this is what I did with it. But if you have patience and if you're kind and if you're just like he says here without envy and you're not proud, you're going to listen to what that person has to say. You see, patience is the ability to endure difficult circumstances without being annoyed, angry, or upset. Folks, I don't have patience. If I look at all the attributes when it comes to love, that's when I struggle with the most, it is, is patience. Because I, I tend to have that schedule set. And I, I guarantee you, there's some type A personalities who are listening to this right now. Some of you women out there, you... No, I shouldn't have said that. Some of you men out there, too, uh, who are dealing with this, who you've got things set in your mind how it's supposed to be, and so you lose your patience with everything that interferes with the way things are supposed to be. And when you saw that person coming down that aisle, well, that was interfering with them. What about this? Kindness. Now, I, I, I don't think that kindness alone shows love. You can be unkind and still be a loving person. It doesn't mean being nice all the time. It means that you show love to a person, being a friendly, generous, uh, 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 considerate type of person. That what they tell you actually means something. That they don't tell you, hey, do me a favor, would you be praying for my brother who's in the hospital right now because of this or that? And then immediately you say, yeah, 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 I'll be praying for him. Who is that again I'm praying for? That's not kindness. That's not what we're talking about. He also says that love is, does not envy it does not boast. It is not proud. Love doesn't focus just on yourself. It focuses on other people. And I think there's something about that that draws us to people who have that type of love in them. You know, like the Mother Teresas of the world. No, no, let's take that back. Better than that, the Jesuses of the world. The people who will set everything aside in order to help other people. And I think that's what we truly need to have in our lives is that type of love that we show to other people. So let's go on from verse 5. He says, It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong." Okay, do this. So you get done talking to that person in Walmart, park, uh, Walmart uh, aisle, and you finally get away from that person, right? And, and you walk away and you think, man, I had so much patience with that guy or girl. And I was so kind to that person. Man, I, I'm just a good person. Then you turn around the corner and you see one of your best friends. Do you immediately start talking bad about that guy you just walked away with, walked away from? Is that what you're going to do? Is that the type of person that you are? Because if you are, you're not showing love. Because love does not dishonor others. Oh, here, this is what I see a lot, is we talk bad about people through our looks, right? You know, like, you know, that type of thing. Guys, love permeates every part of us. It should be seen in our, our expressions that we have towards somebody, in our words that we say to somebody and about somebody. And in this case, it means that you don't go home to your spouse and say, man, you would not believe who I just ran into. Oh, that guy drives me crazy. That's not love. 
And if you're not showing love then, or I mean, if you're going to try to show love in front of the person, show love when you're not in front of the person, when you're away from the person. It tells us by nature, love is not self-centered. That's what that verse says. Uh, verse 6, he says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Now, I look up that translation real quick because you're going to see that there's different translations, depending if you're in the NASB, the NIV, uh, the American Standard Bible, or if you're in even the King James Version. And you're going to see that it's translated either love does not delight in evil, love does not delight in unrighteousness, love does not delight in iniquity. Whichever is your favorite uh, uh, translation there, believe it or not, he's going the same direction with this. You see, the Corinthians were approving of immoral behavior in their society and in their church that they were encouraging people and approving of people who were doing things that were immoral and unrighteous. And it tells us that true love rejoices in the truth. And now the truth is what God gives us. You see, the Bible tells us that God sets the standard for right and wrong. It's not society. It's not communities. It's not what feels good. It's what God says is the standard. And it, if you want to really show love, true love, means that we get our instruction from God. But that also means that you don't hold back telling somebody that too out of love. That, that you don't rejoice in the evil, that you rejoice in the truth. Um, the Bible tells us that we have to take a stand against biblically immoral behavior. Uh, it has nothing to do with trying to be a jerk. It has nothing to do to try to get our way in society. It has to do with what is right and what is wrong. And there's only one person who can say what is right and what is wrong. And that is God. I don't know if you understand this. Well, let me do this real quick. I think everybody can understand that immoral behavior hurts the individual and it hurts the community. And that's why we as Christians, we have to show love to the individual as well as our community and our societies by showing but by speaking out against immoral behavior, we have to encourage people to show, we have to show love to them by encouraging them to live their lives right. And if you're a person who's not living your life right, get your life right. Focus on God. Maybe you're basing your standard wrong. Look at the standard that the Bible gives us, and that's how you should live your life. Going on from there in verse 7, it says, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You know, that's a lot said quick, but I don't know if you ever realized this, but love is like marriage right? All right, think about this. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Uh, the spouses have to protect each other. The children have to protect each, the, the spouses. Wait, I said that all wrong. Let me start that over. When it comes to a marriage, you can see where love is at, right? You can see it in the way that the spouses, the, the parents will protect the children. You see that. They trust, the, the, the children will trust the parents, and that's just how this works. That's a true example of what love is. And if you ever see a relationship where the parents don't protect the children and the children don't trust the, ch the parents, you're going to see a relationship that falls apart very quickly. You're going to see this in the way that, that they look forward to the future together. There's nothing better than starting a marriage and seeing somebody who starts a good relationship together and performing the marriages, knowing that those people are going to stay together for the long haul. That's the hope that only love can give somebody is that true commitment that they have to each other. And it never quits. It tells us that love never gives up. It says it always perseveres. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I honestly believe that love is a verb, that these are the things that we do to prove that we have love for each other. But this is what we do to have love for each other is these things right here. Verse 80 says this, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. You see, guys, love is an attribute of God. If you want to describe God, you have to use the word love to describe him. And we were made in his image, and it tells us that he passed that down to us. Now, the love that you and I have, believe it or not, it's been messed up. Sin has interfered. Things like lust have been considered love. Things like uh, desire have been considered love. Those aren't what love is. Love is what the biblical definition of what God gives us love is. And that's it right there that I just read to you. Listen, willpower fails. Motivation fails. Inspiration fails. But the Bible says that love never fails. That if you have true love in your heart, that you will never give up, that you will never quit, and that whatever work that you do, it should be flavored with love. 
that it should be the coloring of your life, that love should be behind the reason why you preach the sermons that you preach. It should be the reason behind why you listen to the sermons that you listen to. It should be the reason why you spend the time with your kids, why you, why you take the time to correct your children when they're living an immoral lifestyle. It's, it should be the reason why you do the things that you do. It should be the reason why you chase after God. And you know the reason why we love God? It's because he first loved us. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven for those sins. He loves you so much that he was willing to live an absolute selfless life so that you could have the opportunity to love others. But it starts with you having a relationship with him. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, give your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I believe that you are God and that you uh, died and you raised from the grave. I believe that you're alive right now and I give my life over to you. Do that right now and then you can start and change your life to have one that's flavored with love instead of flavored with all these other things. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. I make a lot of mistakes, but love really helps to cover over those mistakes. And I'm so grateful that God has loved me and that he loves you. Let me close with the prayer. Our Heavenly Father, bless these people that are listening to this sermon right now. I pray, Father, that you would use them to change the world for you through the love of Jesus Christ, through the love of each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Folks, thanks so much for listening today. If there's anything you need from me, you can call me or message me. Uh, we love you here at CMOCC, where we're trying to help you love God and love others. Take care. God bless.